And the only other major thing we got to talk about, in case we run out of time, is the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame. We have got five new entrants, four of them voted in. Medico Esasino, 64% of the vote got voted in. He was by far the top vote getter. And I don't even think he was on the ballot last year. Kenny Omega jumped from 53% to 61%. So he went in. Karloff Lagarde from 50% to 61%. And Junakiyama last year at 59%. He got 60% of the vote this year and slid on in. So those are the top four. My guess is that most people are interested in talking about Kenny Omega. And my presumption here is that Kenny Omega, because of the Kenny Omega and Hangman Page versus the Young Bucks match, I think that that's what tipped him over the edge. Because, obviously, one of the things that can get you into the Hall of Fame is the quality of your in-ring work. And, obviously, it's been a source of much contention over the last year, the fact that the five-star scale was broken again. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, if you take those star ratings seriously, and if you agree with them, then the reality is that this guy was in the highest-rated singles match ever in the history of The Observer, and he was in the highest-rated tag team match ever in the history of The Observer, and obviously he's had a million blow-away matches other than that, so sounds to me like his work got him in handily, actually, 61% of the vote. That's a big jump from last year. And like I said, because of the big jump from last year, I think it was the work quality in that tag team match, so... Mike, your thoughts on any of what we just discussed? Um, I'm not so sure about your theory that it was that match that put him over the top because he's been having, you know, forget about throwing superfluous stars six or seven or eight or nine or ten. doesn't matter. You know, just look at it. Level it out at just five stars and look at how many he's had. And I... I just think he's got enough of a connection with today's fans, and not only today's fans, too, because it was spread out, you know, amongst uh, different categories. You know, we probably don't have time to get into the breakdown or, or anything like that, and I'm sure Dave is going to do that over the weekend uh, with Garrett and Wrestling Observer Radio and all that sort of stuff, and there's going to be a lot of talk about it over the next couple of weeks, but I just think that he is that dominant of a superstar of, of this era, uh, and I think he has crossed over to a point where... I think it would be more that people saw him do it in North America. I, I guess that, I guess, uh, maybe, I, I don't well, know. Well, here's why and I think I it's a tag I... match, just very quickly. Because his greatest run ever, I would say almost inarguably, was the last several years in New Japan. And all of that ended last fall. And, I mean, when you consider everything he did in New Japan, it only got him to 53% of the vote. So it seems like it had to have been something that happened over the last year. And quite frankly, I mean, the storyline even is over the last year, he has not been the best bout machine. But there have been two very blow away matches, and one was that tag match. And I guess the other was that Moxley match that they had that was whatever it was. I don't think was. that was it. <laughs> but I mean, that leaves one match, which is that tag team match. I guess, but you know, I, you know, I, the one thing that surprises me about Omega isn't that Omega even got in. It's the disparity. And I had the same, it always blew me away the disparity between Chris Benoit and Eddie Guerrero. And it's not to discount Chris Benoit going into the Hall of Fame, but for years until Eddie Guerrero passed, you look at what his number was and it was like, wow, that's kind of a surprise. And with Kota Ibushi, those two being so joined at the hip and Kota Ibushi. I'm not saying being responsible for Kenny Omega's success, but obviously Omega going over to DDT and joining with Ibushi, I mean, it helped to really kind of kick that up a notch. I was really surprised that Kota Ibushi had actually dropped this year a couple of percentage points down to 38%, really right underneath Akira Tawe, who's got a, because of tag team matches, a ridiculous amount of five-star matches and four-star matches under his belt, and he's not in the Hall of Fame, but I'll just pivot very quickly to Junak Nakayama, I was wondering if Junakiyama would ever get in. It seemed like he was going to hover there forever, and I was wondering if it was going to take some of his management uh, and how he develops other wrestlers and how he kind of uh, 
ran things as a boss and what he could do now with DDT. He's done it with All Japan and with Noah, but I thought that would actually be the thing that pushes him in, but it looks like his past work is probably the thing, and his longevity on the ballot uh, ultimately has gotten him in, so he was a guy that I was really kind of wondering about forever if he'd ever make it, and he's actually been pushed over the edge now, and I guess, you know, one of the names that's been floating out there forever, Mark Rocco is a, and Johnny Sane are going to be two more guys who I think people are going to be trying to get in. Same way with Sergeant Slaughter, who just barely held on to, to staying on the ballot. If you love these video clips, head down there to the bottom right-hand side of the screen and click Join. For just $7.99 per month, you get full access to all of the episodes, over 300 at current count, full-length episodes of The Brian and Vinny Show, Wrestling Observer Live, and Figure Four Daily with both Lance Storm and Filthy Tom Lawler. You can also hit that subscribe button, and you'll always be alerted as to when new shows are available.